Hello and welcome. I'm Diane Baden, a member of the ELECT's Continuing Education Committee. We are pleased to present this webinar in our series on RDA, Resource Description and Access. Our presenter today is Kelly McGrath, Metadata Management Librarian at the University of Oregon. She is an experienced media cataloger and has worked with videos, ebooks, CD-ROMs, computer games, pictures and posters, kits, games, and a variety of three-dimensional objects. She has been active in online audiovisual catalogers, OLAC, for many years, including several years as chair of OLAC's Cataloging Policy Committee. Kelly coordinated the joint OLAC Music Library Association group that participated in the U.S. National Library's RDA test and is currently OLAC's liaison to CCDA. At any time during the webinar, if you have questions for Kelly, please type them into the question box on your screen. Kelly will leave time at the end to respond to as many questions as possible. The ELECT CE Committee also invites you to use the Twitter back channel, hash ELECT CE, if you wish to interact with other participants during or after this webinar. However, if you have questions for the presenter, please use the question box on the screen. We will not be monitoring Twitter during the presentation. Please note that we are recording the presentation and you will receive an email shortly after the conclusion of the webinar with a copy of the slides and a link to the recording. And now I will turn the program over to Kelly. There will be a slight pause as we change presenters. Hi, everybody, and welcome to this tour of the highlights of moving image cataloging using RDA. Before we start, a few cautions. First of all, in my opinion, the cataloging of non-textual media in RDA is less well-developed than many other areas of the text, and there are numerous issues that remain unclear. So there's this and community standards for cataloging moving image resources have not yet been developed. If you work with media or electronic resource cataloging, you're probably already familiar with OLAC, an international organization for catalogers concerned with all types of non-print materials. If you're not, consider and reading their newsletter. It's a worthwhile organization that provides a lot of valuable resources. OLAC's already working on updating their DVD cataloging guide for RDA and will develop other best practices. You should also watch out for changes to RDA itself that will affect moving image cataloging. In this talk, I will mention one change that's already been approved by the JSC related to artistic and technical credits. Other changes are in the works, and OLAC has formed a task force to address additional areas that are problematic for media cataloging. Muted. This presentation represents my best interpretations at this point in time and is not the final word. Plus, even the RDA experts I have consulted disagree about some things. Watch for future developments in emerging practices. And in some cases, I have more, have, may have more questions than answers for you. So let's start with some definitions. This presentation is going to deal with materials that fall into the RDA content types related to moving images. The primary one you'll see is two-dimensional moving image, which means basically what you think it would mean. One important thing to note is that RDA includes video games in this category. RDA has a separate content type for three-dimensional moving images. So if you get a 3D movie, you should use this category. 
I'm going to go through some of these slides a little quickly so you might not have time to read everything. I'll try to express the important points and you may have to go back and look at some of the slides a little later because I have a lot of material to cover. So RDA also has a special content type for cartographic moving images. If you get one of those. And I'll start with where you'll probably start when cataloging. Where do you start looking for information? An important thing to notice is that RDA has special instructions in the section on preferred, preferred sources of information for resources consisting of moving images. Like AACR2, this instruction tells you to start with the title frame or title screen. Title screen is presumably meant for moving image content on a computer carrier, although some title screens seem more analogous to a disk menu than a title frame. If there are no title frames, as in ACR2, you move on to a label on the physical disk or cassette. Unlike in ACR2, there is another option that is on an equal level with labels. You can choose to use embedded metadata for digital video. It's less clear how to apply this in practice since most of us probably don't usually go looking for embedded metadata in videos. You might have this sort of information in a downloadable video or possibly in a streaming video. It's less clear how this applies to DVDs, although I'm sure they have the embedded metadata. However, most people are unlikely to hunt for embedded metadata if there's an easy to find label. If there is no label, I'm not sure how hard RDA requires you to look for embedded metadata, especially when some catalogers might have not have the right tools or skills to access it. It's also not obvious where things like disk menus fit into this hierarchy. So your next choice, number three, for a preferred source is another source forming part of the resource itself assuming the title frames, the disk label, and the embedded metadata did not pan out. Although the relevant parts of RDA are not written as clearly as they might be for a comprehensive description as opposed to an analytic description. This includes accompanying material and publisher supplied containers. There are additional instructions if no title at all is found on the resource itself, but I won't discuss those in this presentation. If you don't want to view the title frames, or it's not practical for you to do so, RDA provides an alternative to start with the disk label. RDA doesn't, or the cassette label or whatever label, RDA doesn't provide an alternative starting point for online moving images, however. According to RDA, when possible, the preferred source for other parts of the description of the manifestation should be the same as that for the title proper. This works less well for moving images, where more authoritative information about commercially published resources, or such as DVDs for editions, publishers, publication dates, series, and so forth, is usually found on the label or container rather than the title frames. So this is just something to be aware of. Another thing to notice is that unlike in ASCR2, information included in the statement of responsibility can come from any part of the resource itself without bracketing or other indication of a different source. You could also combine multiple sources of information to compose one statement of responsibility. Source of title notes are another odd thing in RDA. Source of title notes are not core and therefore not required. In addition, you're only supposed to make them from moving image materials when the title is taken from somewhere other than the title frames. The combination of these two th things actually undermines our ability to reliably know where a title proper came from, which would seem to be the point of the note. If there is no source of title note on an existing record, you have no way to know if it means that someone took the title from the title frames, so they're not allowed to make a note, or if they just didn't make a note because it's not core. It seems to me that a better approach might be for anyone who cares about this to always make a note, especially if it can be put in a field that's suppressed from public display. More information about where data was taken from would seem to be beneficial, especially if we're going to be living in a world of matched up data from many sources. In RDA, parallel titles can be taken from anywhere within the resource without being bracketed or necessarily saying where they came from. 
This could include parallel titles or not optional subtitles on DVDs, which are often useful. There are no limits on parallel titles in RVA, but some DVDs have many, many parallel titles. Parallel titles are not core and thus not required. Best practices will be helpful here. It's useful to compare how statements of responsibility are handled in ACR2 with how they're handled in RVA and how other types of information about responsible entities are handled. AACR2, tell, AACR2 tells you to give people or bodies with a major role in the statement of responsibility and even give some examples of relevant roles, producer, director, animator. It then tells you to relegate all others to notes. AACR2 elaborates on this with a couple of specific types of notes, one for cast and one for non-cast artistic and technical credits. RDA gives only a general definition of what sorts of people and entities go in the statements of in statement of responsibility, which is related to the intellectual or artistic content of a resource and further works and expressions. The statement of responsibility is transcribed from the manifestation but meant to reflect the work or expression. For RDA, a statement of responsibility relates to the identification and or function of any person's families or corporate bodies responsible for the creation of, that is creators, or contributing to the realization of or contributing to an expression of the intellectual artistic content of a resource. RDA then goes on to explicitly exclude certain roles from the statement of responsibility. Instead of telling you who to put in in positive specific terms, RDA tells you who to leave out. These include performers of music and people with performance type functions for moving image materials. It also excludes persons who have contributed to the artistic and or technical production of a resource and entities associated with publication and similar activities. This can be problematic with moving image materials such as many educational videos where it's sometimes hard to tell if an entity is just publishing or distributing a video or if they were also involved in its production. Many moving image resources, especially major motion pictures, have extensive statements of responsibility. RDA only requires one statement of responsibility. It is better to try to include the most important or more important ones. Recording the one that appears first is unlikely to be a helpful approach for moving image materials. In the RDA chapter on content-related attributes of expressions, there's a non-transcribed element for recording performers, narrators, and presenters if considered important. Interestingly, there's no instruction to record role or function, only medium of performance for musicians. However, I don't think there's anything in RDA that would prevent us from continuing to record roles like narrator, dancer, or voice actor here. There's also a non-transcribed element for artistic and or technical credits. This is how the beginning of the rule currently looks in the toolkit, where it is limited to motion pictures and video recordings. So we have people or corporate bodies, et cetera, making contributions to artistic and or technical production of a motion picture or video recording. This at their last meeting, the JSC approved some changes to this instruction. These changes have not been published yet. Music catalogers had been used to recording sound recording producers and similar roles in the equivalent AACR2 note, which the narrower definition in RDA disallowed. So the JSC has responded to these concerns by expanding these instructions to include any type of resource. Since these instructions are the part of IRDA devoted to content-related attributes of its expressions, you should only include roles here that RDA has mapped to expressions. Roles mapped to expressions can also be included in the statement of responsibility, and some, such as translator, 
have traditionally been included there. This role is as an example of one that was carried over pretty much as is from ACR2 without thinking about how it really fits with RDA and FERBER. There will probably be work in the future to make this divide more principled or even eliminated. Also notice that the artistic part of this de definition, Mark says, contributed to the artistic production, is not defined in a way that makes it easy to distinguish from the roles that appear in the statement of responsibility for entities for, that are responsible for the creation of or contributed to the artistic content. So here are a few more details related to this instruction and the recent changes where it's been expanded to resource. More room is left for judgment by saying to include those that are considered important rather than trying to define who to leave out. As in the equivalent rule in ACR2, preface each name or group of names with a statement of function. So here's an example. Notice that the director and screenwriter appear in the statement of responsibility because they're related to the work. I think in real life you would want to label the performers as cast, but the instructions don't actually tell you to do that. Of course, there's an indicator for cast in the 511 field and mark, but not for other common types of performers. So another really important development for moving image resources in RDA is the emphasis on relationship designators. There are many, many functions involved in the creation of a film or TV program, and it's important to tell users who's doing what. So I would like to quickly run through some of the more important ones for moving images, along with some unresolved issues. Also, remember that the RDA list is meant to contain common roles and is not comprehensive. So you'll run into lots of roles not on this list, such as elaborations on existing categories like medical photography, stage director, executive producer, or series producer, or other functions entirely like costume designer. I had one once where it was a travel log and some people were credited as cooks, demonstrated or ran restaurants. When OLAC reviewed the RDA drafts, we had some disagreements with the mapping of roles to Ferber Group 1 entities, but right now I'll just try to explain what RDA says. So Appendix I, which lists relationship designators, is divided into several categories. In the creator of the work category, you'll find filmmaker and screenwriter. Screenwriter is a subcategory of author. The screenwriter is clearly the creator of a printed script but has not traditionally been considered to be a creator of a moving image. However, screenwriter does not appear anywhere else in the list of RDA relationship designators. I have been told conflicting things about how to interpret this by people more expert in RDA than I am. However, I would provisionally use the screenwriter designator on moving image records so that we will have the data later to identify them once this is sorted out. There is also a category for persons, etc., associated with the work. These are roles that are considered to be related to the work entity, but not considered creators. That is, these are roles that are not candidates for main entry in ACR2 terms. Here we find director and producer with subcategories for film and television. In RDA, you can always use the more general role in place of the specific one. I'm planning to stick with director and producer since I don't see any benefit in split files on this characteristic. Stay tuned for best practices in this area. Finally, director of photography also falls into this category. This is why RDA puts cinematographers in the statement of responsibility, even though we're most of us not used to doing things that way. Because RDA associates cinematographers with the work, and the artistic technical credit element is limited to what RDA labels as expression level roles. So there's also a very long list of relationship designators that are related to expressions that are likely to be useful for moving image cataloging. So here are just a few examples. 
particularly notice that there is a role labeled composer qualified by expression in parentheses. This needs to be contrasted with the plain composer relationship designator listed under creators in order to be understood. The plain composer relationship designator would be used for a musical score sound recording where the composer would be considered the creator and recorded in the 100 field. Composers on moving image works are considered by RDA to be associated with the expression. So you should use the composer with expression and parentheses relationship designator on moving image resources. RDA also includes similar relationship designators for choreographer, interviewee, and interviewer qualified by expression and parentheses. All performance type roles are also associated with the expression in RDA. There's an umbrella performer term as well as many more specific terms. You can use whichever level you prefer, although here I think a more specific term would be more helpful. Production companies are associated with the work in RDA. As I said before, one practical challenge with some videos is that it's hard to say if a company is just a publisher or distributor, or if they actually had a role in the production of the content. The more challenging problem for many libraries is that they do make access points for publishers and distributors of moving image materials, but RDA doesn't list any relationship designators for them. Since my time is short, I'm not going to try to reproduce the explanations I've been given for this. It's related to the fact that publisher and distributor are RDA elements in themselves. However, it seems to me that you should still be able to use these terms justified either by RDA's instruction, sorry, I'm on the wrong slide. Um, if none of the terms listed in this appendix is appropriate or sufficiently specific, use a term indicating the nature of the relationship as concisely as possible, or by using a term from a standard vocabulary such as the MARC vocabulary, which contains both terms and codes. So the OLAC group that participated in the RDA test thought it was most practical for typical library cataloging to limit the moving image specific relationship designators for corporate bodies to production companies and publishers and distributors. But stay tuned for community best practices. So probably the most obvious change in an RDA record is the replacement of the GMD with the content media carrier triad. So I'd like to go through some typical examples for moving images. This is what you would do for a typical DVD or Blu-ray that many of us catalog. The content type is two-dimensional moving image. The media type is video and the carrier type is video disc. This also works for the less common digital disc-based formats like laser discs and VCDs that you might run across. For a VHS or other video cassette, you do the same thing, except that you substitute video cassette for video disc in the carrier type field. So here's a good example of the content carrier split in RDA. Streaming or downloadable videos are moving image content presented via an online computer-based carrier. Notice that the 3.3x fields for an online video game are the same as for a streaming video. It might be desirable to add computer program as a second content type, although the examples for computer program given in RDA are operating systems and application software. So the OLAC test group was not really sure if that was applicable or not. In parallel to online computer-mediated moving image content, there's also moving image content encoded on direct access computer resources. Here are the content, media, and carrier values for a DVD-ROM with moving image content, either in the form of videos for watching or as a video game. A CD-ROM would be treated the same way. Here is an example of what you might do for a dual disc which is a format that has a standard DVD video on one side and CD or DVD audio on the other. RDA does a better job of bringing out all aspects of the resource than ACR2 did. 
where here we can see that it's easy to bring out in parallel the two-dimensional moving image content and the performed music as well as the dual nature of the carrier. What about the ever controversial PlayAway? PlayAway has come out with the PlayAway View, which is a small device preloaded with a video. I don't know the answer to this, but here are a few possibilities. In OLAC's AACR2 based best practices, PlayAways were considered to have a computer carrier and an electronic resource GMD. Some have argued that PlayAways have an audio or video carrier, as in the second example. It's also been proposed that since users don't have to do anything except put in batteries, flyaways should be considered unmediated objects. It seems to me that the fact that the mediation is transparent to the end user doesn't mean that the content is unmediated. We're likely to see all sorts of intermediation becoming increasingly invisible, but I don't think that means that we can stop recording the details of the intermediation. However, this is very much an open question. And RDA did not actually completely resolve the play away issue as many of us hoped, so stay tuned. RDA has also introduced a number of new technical elements. These are largely things that catalogers have already been recording, but many of them were not explicitly addressed by AACR2. The first is the video format element, seen here with some of its most common values. Note that the video format element is limited to analog video content. There is also a broadcast standard element which includes these four television broadcast standards. There is a separate element for digital video encoding formats. The things that are listed here are, in my opinion, something of a mixed bag of apples and oranges. These are all the values that are listed for this element. They're not all the same kind of thing, and there are some odd omissions. RDA has also provided an element for regional encoding. Although it has unwisely been limited to DVDs, but Blu-ray videos also have region codes. In addition, there's a new element for aspect ratio. This element includes both the term full screen or wide screen or mixed from this list. Note that wide screen is given as two words even though you're probably unlikely to see it appear on a video like that in real life. This is accompanied by a numerical ratio with a denominator of one. In addition, RDA encourages you to give you a note if a video has been not modified from its original aspect ratio, um, such as in a pan and scan version. This is less common now with the proliferation of widescreen TVs, but is very important to some patrons. So now that we have all these new elements, how do we record them and mark? It turns out that there are a plethora of options, which is probably not going to be very good for copy cataloging or consistency of display. So option one that I'm going to show here uses the controlled list of carrier terms in 300 subfield A, one video disk, and is similar to an AACR2 record. This looks a lot like what most of us do today. RDA Appendix D maps aspect ratio to a general 500 note rather than a system requirement. Since it's a description of the way the image appears rather than telling you what kind of equipment you need to play something. RDA does not have an instruction corresponding to the AACR2 rule that allowed you to combine notes. So potential option two is very similar to option one except that it uses a term in common use rather than a term from the controlled list in 300 subfield A, one DVD video. DVD video seems to be more specific than DVD, which could refer to a number of different types of carriers. It then seems to be redundant to note DVD in the system requirements note. So option three shows an alternative mapping from the RDA appendix on RDA to mark mapping. 
where a broadcast standard and digital video encoding format are mapped to parts of the 300 field. This has the advantage of displaying these pieces of information earlier and more prominently in the record. One oddity of the RDA mapping is that video formats such as VHS map to 300 subfield A, while digital video encoding formats such as DVD video map to 300 subfield B, even though patrons are probably think of them as the same type of information. A disadvantage with this approach that it has in common with notes is that all the elements are strung together and there's no machine interpretable, mar interpretable marking telling you where one begins and the other ends or even what elements are present. To get around that limitation, four new fields have been introduced into MERC where the new RDA technical data elements can be recorded in discrete MERC fields and subfields. Here I show three of these. Each element gets its own subfield, but these elements will come a little further down in the display in most catalogs and also make the display longer. The option for mapping the new technical elements to the 300 field was thought to be the most user-friendly by most of the OLAC testing group. But this option to use the new discrete fields is probably best for future data use, reuse, and migration. Hopefully there will be best practices for this and we will get a data format that will allow us to truly separate data and display for these elements. Okay, so here are a few more examples. Um, the top one is for a fairly straightforward streaming video. The second one is for a video cassette. Note that you do have a number of options as to where you put the information about VHS, either in 346 subfield A, in 538, or in the parentheses uh, following one video cassette in 300 subfield A. During the RDA test, the LC policy statement said to use the alternative to record dimensions in, issue, in inches for video desks and all audio carriers. They did not make an exception for video cassettes. So if that remains unchanged and you're following the policy statements, you may have to use two centimeters here rather than one half inch. Also notice that although in the previous example, DVD video went into the new field 347 for digital characteristics, VHS goes in field 3, er, sorry. DVD went into 347 for digital characteristics, VHS goes in 346 for video characteristics. So here's an example for the dual disc that I talked about before and also one for Blu-ray which is essentially the same as what you would do for a DVD, except that where you say DVD, you would say Blu-ray. Um, one interesting thing is that for some reason, RDA in its list of terms has capitalized the R in Blu-ray, although that is not actually the official form. So here are a couple more examples of moving image content on DVD-ROM or CD-ROM the top one using conventional terminology in 300 subfield A, and one with the term from the standard list on the bottom. If you use the term from the standard list in 300 subfield A, you should mention something about the type of equipment needed for playback in the system requirements. These examples look similar to the ones on the previous slide, but they're for video games. Um, and again, they're treated similarly to other sorts of moving image content on physical media. You can use either the standard term or a term in common use in 300 subfield A and give the same kinds of information that you would give for other moving image content. So there's also now a separate accessibility element where things like captions, subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing, often seen on discs as SDH, and audio description should be recorded. 
And here are a few examples of the accessibility content element, which pretty much look like what we do right now. Contents notes. There's not much guidance in RVA for constructing formal contents notes. Probably the most practical thing to do is to continue current practice, which is what the Library of Congress recommended to the OLAC group during the test. Although the relevant RDA element is called structured description of the related work, for moving image content, it often includes information that RDA maps to expressions, such as duration and color. And for information related to title and responsibility is also often transcribed from a specific manifestation. Here are a couple of examples which look a lot like what we currently do now, um, except for the spelled out abbreviations. Okay. Now I'm just going to list some elements that are not really significantly different from what we do now in ACR2. And I'm not going to go into any detail on these, but RDA does include elements for audience, for summaries, for place of data capture, for language of the content. It also includes elements for color of moving image, sound content, duration, and this one was not explicit in ACR2, but there is also now a separate element for awards. So finally, what I'd like to do is give an example of an issue that came up for the OLAC group during the RDA test, and which probably needs some sort of best practices to resolve it. So although I won't be giving you any definitive answers here, I think it is helpful to remember that we are all going to encounter situations as we try to use RDA where it's sort of unsettled, it's unclear what to do, um, some things are hard to interpret, or they don't seem to actually work very well when you start applying them. So the general instructions for the language of expression element are at 6.11. The first rule shown here recommends using a term from a standard list. The second tells you that if you have a single expression that is in multiple languages, record each of the languages. For moving images, this would probably be used for the original soundtrack of a movie that was filmed in more than one language, such as Babel, which had parts in English and Arabic and Spanish and Japanese and a number of other languages. RDA tells you that when you're identifying an expression, you should include as a minimum the elements listed here that are applicable to the expression. One of these is language of expression. In current cataloging, access points are often used to identify expressions. RDA says that you don't have to identify the expression with an access point, nor do you have to record the elements in the access point, the identifying elements in the access point. As an alternative, you can record them as separate elements, which means you could record them in the body of the description, such as in the 546 note, or in the language fixed field, and in 041. The Library of Congress policy statement for the test said to always include elements used to differentiate one expression from another in the access point, although this LCPS is labeled LC practice. So where does that leave us with moving image resources? If you work at all with DVDs of feature films, you know that they often come with a multitude of language options. The first thing that's not clear in RDA is at what level are we being told to distinguish language expressions? Do we only include spoken or sung languages, or should we also include subtitle tracks or intertitles on silent films? Should we distinguish between soundtrack and subtitle languages in the access point? How finally do we need to distinguish types of written access and access point subtitles versus captions, or SDH? So I'd like to work through options 
some options for a simple but reasonably typical DVD of a major motion picture that has English and French soundtracks and optional English subtitles for the deaf, of, deaf and hard of hearing and optional Spanish subtitles. So during the test, OLAC considered a number of options for making access points for language expressions. One of them would be to give only the soundtrack languages and consider each language option to be a separate expression, giving only the English and French soundtracks. You could give only the soundtrack languages and consider the DVD as a whole to be a separate expression and give an access point sort of for the language options as a bundle. Um, this is similar to what was typically done in ACR2. However, RDA considers each language version to be a separate expression. And as is done for a book with a parallel translation and a facing page, each language expression requires a separate expression access point. So this would not be correct. We also considered giving both the soundtrack and subtitle languages without distinguishing between them. So in this example, the access point that's qualified by English is doing double duty for both the English soundtrack and the English SDH option. Although RDA is silent on this issue, you could qualify each language by the type of language access provided. So we could have then two access points for English, one for the soundtrack and one for the subtitles. And we also consider jamming all of the language options together in one access point. But as was the case with the previous example, using just the soundtracks, this would not be correct under RDA since these are all different expressions. Finally, if you really wanted to give people all their options, you could give an access point for each possible combination of options. However, it's horrifying to contemplate trying to record the exponentially increasing number of variations on some DVDs. There is also a rule in RDA that says if more than one expression, if there is more than one expression of the work, record the expression manifested. If more than one expression is embodied in the manifestation, only the predominant or first named expression manifested is required. So this option means that you wouldn't have to make an access point for all the language expressions on the DVD. You could just do the first or predominant one. And this would certainly uh, simplify the amount of work that the catalog would have to do. However, you would end up with an essentially arbitrary access point that would seem to undermine the usefulness of these expression access points since they wouldn't be predictable for users. They wouldn't know why this one is qualified by language and this other option is not qualified by language. So trying to record all the language variations on some DVDs and access points is going to be a lot of work. Do our users really use our alphabetical title browse index this way? If they're looking for a known title, having multiple entries for a single DVD would not necessarily seem to be helpful. So perhaps our time would be better spent coding the OA language fixed field and the 4 one field and using those for searching. Although we also need to lobby for systems that use those fields effectively. So my own preference is to largely stick with work access points for moving images and record distinguishing elements like language in another element, which is allowed by RDA, although not by the current LC policy statement. However, that policy statement is marked as LC practice. So this is another area where uh, best practices or community practices will be very helpful. Um, here's a link to a document with lots more discussion on access points for expressions. And finally, a plug for something that I personally believe is very important, which is that we should be recording more information that users want as data that a computer can identify and manipulate. Here are some examples of relevant data elements that can be recorded in MARC bibs for moving images. It would also be beneficial in the long run to have more authority records for moving images so we don't have to keep redundantly recording the same data. 
And finally, after all that, does anyone have any questions? I hope I haven't totally overwhelmed you. Hello, everyone. It's Diane Baden again. Um, I'm going to field the questions, which you may type into the question box. I apologize for my earlier technical difficulties. So while you're doing that, I just want to repeat a couple of announcements that I made. One is that the presentation is being recorded, and you will get um, an email shortly after we conclude with the recording and the PowerPoint. So you will get to see all of Kelly's slides. Um, at this point, I'm going to see what questions we've received so far. And those of you who have some can continue to type them into the question box. And Kelly will answer as many as we have time for. Um, so the first question that I see has to do with the term flash video in the streaming video 300 subfield B. Is that a standard term to be used for all streaming video? Um, no, it would not be a standard term for all streaming video because it would depend on the type of video that's being streamed. So I think, like for example, a lot of the videos, maybe most of the videos, I'm not the most technologically literate on this, on YouTube use Flash, but many streaming video services use Real Player or Windows uh, media files. So you would have to determine if you considered it important the type of video file that was being streamed. OK, um, a clarification question. Am I to understand that the 546 field will no longer be used for languages? Um, no, I didn't mean to present it that way. It would be used for languages. And in addition, RDA has mapped it to this accessibility element, which I think is sort of an acknowledgment of the way we currently do things where things like closed captions are recorded in the 546. So 546 should include both accessibility content and language information. OK, we've got a couple of questions on this, which does not surprise me, which has to do with the abbreviations for inches and minutes. What is or is not abbreviated in RDA? Well, um, let me look this up very quickly, but I think what is abbreviated is in one of these appendixes and inches and, let me see here, appendix B on abbreviations, and no, I don't have everything in RDA memorized yet. Um, so for example, there are abbreviations which it says to use for duration, um, which includes SEC for seconds, but I'm, and it does say MIN for minutes here, so it does look like you're supposed to abbreviate those. Um, and inches is also listed, so where you would want to look for that is in Appendix B of RDA. Um, and so some few things are still abbreviated. OK. Um, in terms of access points, how would you distinguish between a 2D and 3D moving image resource for the same work? Well, that is a very good question. But I think in the chapter on expressions and identifying expressions, there is a sort of a catch-all element that yes, in 6.12, other distinguishing characteristic of the expression. Um, so I think that you would just be able to sort of append that on the end of the access point. Although I um, actually have to admit that I'm not quite sure how you would tag that in MARC. Um, I think we will need some um, community guidance on that issue, but this um, other distinguishing characteristics is a real catch-all thing that would 
sort of allow you to work in anything else that should come up. How will the relationship designators deal with people with unclear roles or multiple roles, and how will that affect authority files? Um, unclear roles, it doesn't really deal with very well. I think one thing to keep in mind is that you're not required to make a relationship designator, so if you can't figure out what the person is doing, you, you can just leave that off. Um, if you have multiple roles, it seems like the common practice is, and there's an example of this or two in the MARC format, is to sort of string them together after the access points you would have a multiple uh, subfield E's with the different relationship designators. Now how that works for access I'm not sure and I don't know that that would have a, a direct impact on authority files because it sort of really depends on how you set up your display are you including these terms in, in the browse list so that it separates it out? Are you not? How are you providing access to the relationship designators? So I think that the impact really depends on how you've set up your display, although it is unfortunate that these kind of linear strings are not very flexible in that regard. Um, a question about the 336, 337, and 338 fields, um, how they will appear in online catalogs, how they will help a user know if they're viewing a DVD or a VHS, uh, I guess the, the varying roles between those fields and the 300 field. Yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting because like the GMD, the 33X, you know, fields are very general, and I think I saw somewhere recently some research that suggested that, that people are actually wanting to access this at the more specific level. They don't want to limit to two-dimensional moving image content or even video recording. They want DVD or Blu-ray or those more specific things. So that would be one advantage of, I think, of these new um, three, four X fields in that you could get those things to display in a, in a separate field like DVD video. And then if you had that in a separate field, you could easily make it very prominent in your display without having to do what a lot of libraries do now in their local catalog where they use non-standard GMDs like DVD to help their patrons. Um, but it's true that I think that we have to come up with some way to allow users access not just to the sort of the general terms but also to the more specific terms that they're seeking. Um, a couple of more big picture questions including someone asking what is your take on a replacement for Mark? I don't know if you want to put yourself out on that limb. But. <laughs> um, I don't know. Well, I very much, the postmark world cannot come soon enough for me because I think that we would be able to do much, much more with a more flexible format that was designed to meet the information needs of today and not constrained by the technology of the 1960s. Mark is a great achievement. It's you know, it was amazing for what it was able to do with the technology of its day, but now we're kind of like fighting with our hands behind our back if we limit ourselves to Mark. But I, I hesitate to speculate on exactly what that will look like. <laughs> Another general question, um, new formats emerge all the time. Will OLAC as a group re be reviewing the term designators that are going to be used for new formats? Um, I don't know, but certainly OLAC will be trying to stay abreast of new formats and we've been trying to provide input to CCDA and JSC and to, you know, hopefully OLAC will be well positioned to address new formats as they emerge, as we know they all 
just keep and, doing. <laughs> and is OLAC going to be the ones developing the best practices um, that you've referred to? Well, OLAC is going to develop best practices. Um, certainly, it doesn't mean that OLAC would be the only uh, organization developing best practices. Um, some institutions I know have developed um, practices and guidelines for their own internal use of the institutions that are already using RDA. There may be other organizations with um, an interest in that, so it doesn't necessarily mean that there would only be one set of best practices that's, you know, and of course, as we all know, RDA gives us lots and lots of options anyway, so that will be quite interesting to see how that develops. But OLAC is committed to, as our resources allow, um, developing best practices, yes. Okay, I think we can squeeze in one more. Um, it says, you mentioned the composer and then parentheses expression, is that in one field or a combination of fields like our current 100 to 40 access point? So that's all in one field. So what you would get is, uh, totally in the wrong place, you would get something like, you know, I don't know, Tchaikovsky and then you would get a subfield E, and in the subfield E, it would literally say composer with expression in parentheses. Now, what your average patron is going to make of that, I don't know. But for some reason, it was very important to the developers of RDA to map an exact term only to one of the Ferber Group 1 entities. And so that seems to have be the outcome of that. But it's all sort of one thing, just like editor of moving image work, which despite the fact that it has work in there, is, you know, it's all one big phrase and one subfield. And we have someone supplying an answer to the question on abbreviations. Generally, dimensions and units of time are abbreviated. So that explains both inches and minutes being um, abbreviated. Okay, we're out of time for questions, but I would like to do uh, uh, some closing. So if I can have the screen back, please. Um, I will uh, show you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Kelly for uh, helping us understand the differences between AACR2 and RDA for moving images. This is the schedule of the remaining RDA webinars for this spring. As you can see, Kelly will be back in two weeks to do RDA and 3D objects and kits. And then in May, we have um, a fabulous uh, duo of uh, webinars, one on uh, RDA and rare materials, and the other one on RDA and archival materials. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to those. Uh, be sure to check the ELECTS website for registration information, upcoming webinars, and any other ELECTS CE events. Uh, attendees will receive an online evaluation form from ELECTS. Please respond as we value your input. We welcome your suggestions for new webinars. And you will also find a form for submitting proposals for webinars on the ELECTS website. Before we sign off, I would like to thank Felicity and Aping for providing technical support for today's webinar. Um, and again, my apologies for my own technical problem. Uh, we appreciate your attendance today. We look forward to sharing other topics with you in the future. Thank you all for attending and have a good day. <laughs>